Now, this is where I need you to get involved. So on your desk in front of you, there will be a notepad. Uh, you'll need the notepad and a pen, and you'll want the notepad in the landscape. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take you through a workflow process to get you considering and planning what you need to do, some of the things that you need to consider, and this way you can actually do it for you in your context. Take a photo if, if you want to, if you don't want to keep the actual note, but you can actually do this yourself, take it home, and then you've got that there as a resource to start actually thinking about implementing this in your room. Now, keep in mind that what I do for me in my context with the Year 5, 6 class is probably quite different to how Heather manages hers in a senior mathematics, which is probably different to how Jeremy manages his biology um, with the senior kids. So you need to think about this from your context. So keep that in mind that this works for me, may not necessarily work for you, but it's a starting point. Now, this particular process I picked up from Joel Speranza at Flipcon last year. Um, now, there are six things that we need to consider. Is that readable for you guys at the back? Yes? Yeah, cool. So the first thing you need to consider is what's your presentation service going to be? So have a think about the videos that you've worked on yesterday and today, and think about if I was to go home and do this video again, what would I actually use to present the information and the learning in that video? So the first column is simply presentation. So for me, the common tools that I use are a piece of paper, uh, a mini whiteboard, uh, a workbook, a document camera, which I actually left off there, um, if I'm doing what we'll call analog handwritten stuff. If I'm doing something online, I'm typically using the Google suite of apps, Google Slides, Docs, Sheets. Um, and for the FTPL videos, I'll be using other websites, Twitter, whatever the case might be. So have a think about for the videos that you've done yesterday and today, what presentation tools are you going to use to present the information? The common ones that you would use regardless of what the topic is. We'll consider subject specific things later on. But think about what are the uh, general tools that you're going to use in pretty much every video. And I'll give you a moment to just make a few notes about that. worked out what your presentation surface is going to be, you do need to think about how are you going to capture that information. Now, for me, if I'm using handwritten uh, presentation surface, so whiteboard, a workbook, piece of paper, I'll use a document camera, um, and that will feed into a program called XSplit, which I'll show you in another section. If I'm using online tools, then I use a piece of software called Camtasia. Um, and I'll show you that. It's the main tool that I use. I've spoken to a few of you about it in passing. Um, it's incredibly powerful. It has a lot of really useful tools, uh, but it does come with a cost. So have a think about how are you going to capture the prep the learning? Are you going to use a document camera? Are you going to have an iPad, a tripod? Are you going to use Screencast-O-Matic or Screencastify? There you go. Have a think about what you will use to capture the learning. So the next thing we need to consider, once you've got your video that's edited, it's rendered, it's ready to go, is where are you going to host it? So Jeremy's spoken before about a few, uh, a few options. Um, YouTube, I do agree, is the best one. Uh, for New South Wales DOE schools, though, it's a no-go. As is Vimeo, as is TeacherTube, as is StudentTube, all the useful ones. Um, Google Drive, if your school, well, actually, no, if you're in a DOE school, the, you will have access to the Google Apps for Education suite, which means you've got a essentially unlimited Google Drive that you can access through your department portal. Some of the private schools have um, gone that way as well. I know, Heather, you've got that? Oh, the Google Apps for Education? No? Okay, so I was wrong. So some private schools have gone that way, but it's essentially unlimited. So I've pushed all of my videos to Google Drive as well. 
And all I've done is I've got a folder for my students uh, in Google Class, and within that folder is spelling, is maths, you know, week one, week two, and so on. And they access that folder to get access to the videos. Where you host the video is obviously going to depend on your context. If you can get access to YouTube, awesome. Full steam ahead, whack them up there and off you go. If you can't get access to, or your students can't get access to YouTube rather, you do need to consider some other options. The next thing from that is how to make the videos interactive. Now, Jeremy's spoken about this a little bit. We've got Zaption, Edpuzzle, and what was the other one, Jeremy? Podposit, Play? Ed, Puzzle, Play, Posit. Play, Posit. So there are three tools that you can use. Um, the software that I primarily use, Camtasia, has an inbuilt quiz function, which emails you the results uh, once a day of students that have completed that video, that have watched that video. Um, Zaption is the top, the one that I've written on the top there. Camtasia is the one on the bottom. The one in the middle is a website called My Ed App. Um, I stumbled across those guys at Future Schools last year. Really powerful tool, very, very useful, very flexible. It would work well as an LMS. It works well as a hosting site. You can embed in it for YouTube and it bypasses the DOE blocker using a proxy. Really powerful. Um, but again, there's a cost involved to that. Um, they do do single user licenses, um, but you would need to email them and, and ask them about specific pricing. Can you say the new one again, sorry? Yeah, so the new one is My Ed App, M Y E D A P P. So My Ed App. And it's just a, a web platform access, accessible on any device. And it's really, really useful. So we've already spoken a little bit about the interactive tool, so I won't sort of linger on that too long. The LMS, again, this comes down to your context. Our school is a Google school almost by default because the DOEs pay for access to the Google Apps for Education suite. So we're using Google Class. Um, I'm not entirely happy with how Google Class works and the workflow um, functions. I'm not, I can't put a finger on what it is that I'm not happy about, but I know that I'm not happy with it. Um, I've explored Edmodo a little bit, I've done some playing around at home, and it will probably be my next sunset to shake the hands. No. Uh, uh, kids don't like it? No. I've seen shakes and I've seen nods. So, I like kids do. Okay. So I might explore that one a little bit with, with, with some students. We might do it a trial. The other one I mentioned before, my app can be used as a LMS. Um, I absolutely love the tool, and the only reason I'm not using it is because I don't have enough to put into it at this point to make it worthwhile. Um, it wasn't massively dear, I can't remember the cost is offhand, but it wasn't massively dear. Um, but if you just tweet at my Ed app, um, have a conversation with those guys, they're really, really fantastic blokes. They've been at a few conferences that Future Schools and FlipCon. It works beautifully. It has the interactivity, it has the LMS, it has automatic marking for quizzes and multiple choice. It has short form and long form open response. You can have set a task for the students to record a video to input back into it. I love it. That's time for it at the moment. Following on from that, you need to consider how you're going to assess the learning within your flipped class. And again, this is contextual. What are you going to do in your particular room? So at the moment for me in a primary situation with my students, I'm still doing marking and work samples. I'm still having conferences and one-on-ones with my students or one-on-twos with my students because that's just part of it's just part of being a teacher. I'm sure we're all doing that. I'm sure that Jeremy, you still do conferences every single day with your students and have conversations with them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So that I'll doesn't go away. that doesn't go away at all. So what can you add to that? So I love Google Forms as an option uh, because it's so versatile. Exaption, Edpuzzle, we've talked about a number of other tools that are available. Um, in the interactivity section, that also translate into assessment tools. Now subject specific tools, this comes down to what you're teaching. So the tools that Heather uses as a maths teacher, those specific tools are different to what Jeremy uses. They will be different to what, do I have any cat teachers in here? Taz, they'll be different to what you use in a Taz context. So you need to think about, in my discipline, 
what are the specific tools that I need to use to teach my concepts or my skills? And that's where you would incorporate that information in your specific context, in your discipline or subject area. So just have to think about that for a couple of moments and just make a note of a few tools that you might already have up your sleeve. If you've got a couple but you'd like more options, jump on Twitter, connect with the three of us with, uh, and we'll put in touch with other educators and you'll then be able to get access to you know, educators around the world. If I want to teach X, does anyone have a tool for doing it that they love and why? And you can get guidance and help and support from educators all around the world. So are we all happy with that process? Does that sort of work for you? Does it make sense? Yeah, excellent. So moving on from that, there is one other element that we need to consider. You need to consider what is the tools that require expertise in use? So this is what are the tools that the students need to know how to use? Now typically a school will have one or two standards. So we're a Google school, so we expect our students to be able to use Google Drive, Google Class, and Google Docs primarily. Your school might be a Edmodo school, or a Moodle school, or a, what's the one that you have, Jeremy? For our learner management, yeah. Daymap. Daymap? Yeah, so no you, one seems to know what that was. Yeah. Yet, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it comes down to your context. What is your school using? And if they're not using anything, maybe that's a starting point for you to have that conversation with the relevant stakeholders. There are these tools I'd like to try, what do you think, what's the possibility? Now, on top of that, we need to consider what are we expecting our students to understand? So in my context, they already need to know three tools. That's not actually that many, but particularly for a secondary context, if Jeremy wants his students to use one tool, Heather wants her students to use another one, Taz want two, maybe, the PE team, six, so six tools, so, out, so I'm out of fingers. PE wants one tool, English wants another, You've loaded up your students and they've got 10, 12, 13 different tools that they're expected to be able to use competently and efficiently. So you need to factor that in mind and that's where a bit of cross-faculty discussion um, very much will come in useful, particularly if it turns out that you're considering one tool in English and it turns out that maths are also considering the same tool for something, we'll have that conversation and maybe try that together because it's one less thing that your students need to understand how to use, which reduces the pushback from the kids. The general rule of thumb that Joel Speranzo gave at Foodcom, school standard plus two. Don't ask your kids to have expertise in any more than the school standards plus two, which I think is a fairly reasonable limit, um, given everything else that they've no doubt got going on. Now, in terms of what you need to master, or well, how ambitious are you and how much time do you have? There, there's not really a limit on that. And I made a comment to someone today that um, they commented that they signed up to three or four different new things yesterday and today. And I said, you'll probably end up with 15 or 16 different accounts, but you might end up only actually using two or three of them on any sort of regular basis. So you need to consider that there's nothing wrong with signing up for 30 different programs and platforms and tools but don't expect to actually use them all. Test them, experiment, play with them and work out, no, I don't like that one, bump it, move on to the next one. 